Hello and welcome to an interview for the Above the Parapet project with Her Excellency the High Commissioner of Papua New Guinea, Winnie Kiap. Your Excellency, thank you very much for joining us today. You are the High Commissioner to the UK, Israel, Cyprus, South Africa, Egypt, Zimbabwe, I think I've covered all the countries, for Papua New Guinea. Uh, and you're the second woman to hold this post of whom I'm aware. Um, can you tell me, just as an overview, how you came to that position? What, what in public life took you to that, to that role? Because you sent, spent pretty much all your working life in public service. I started off my public service career with the, in the Kingdom of Tonga yeah. after finishing university. Um, and then I joined the PNG Public Service in the early 90s. Perhaps in the early 90s I was lucky that uh, I got, I was slotted in rather than work my, my way up the public service, mm -hmm. which would have taken a long time. Right. I entered at a level where I was visible um, and um, that took me to be appointed as uh, secretary to cabinet. I held that position for almost 11 years. So perhaps when I left, left the public service they thought I could still contribute mm. and perhaps as a high commissioner um, because I left when I reached retirement age. Mm. Uh, and that's how I got here. So you um, were the first woman to be cabinet secretary in Papua New Guinea and I'm wondering what challenges you faced in that position. What was different for you as a woman do you think? to the men who, who held that post before you? It was, um, it was a very difficult entry into that particular job. Um, at that point, the Office of Cabinet Secretary was sort of a background office. Mm -hmm. No one knew much about the wor inner workings of Cabinet. You hear what the Cabinet has said, but you didn't know how the Cabinet arrived at these decisions. Yeah. I said yes not knowing exactly what I was getting myself into. Um, but when I went in, I was faced with the challenge of working with a group of men. This, they were all men. And I was told later that um, a lot of change had to take place in the cabinet room when, when I became a woman was now among them. They had to mind their manners, they had to mind their language, they had to mind all these things. So, But um, the main challenge for me at that point was to very, very quickly learn about all the government systems, mm -hmm. all the laws. I had to be on top of all the laws. I'm not a lawyer by training. I was never in that sort of environment. So it had to be a very, very quick um, learning experience for me. and. What I had to uh, master as well is to give advice to a group of men, I, a woman, mm -hmm. in a, a Papua New Guinean setting. Yeah. Um, and that, that took me a while to say to myself, um, the job is to give advice, the job is to give advice, the job is to give advice. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who is giving advice, the right advice has to be given. So it took a while for me to, um, to gear myself up to be that person giving advice, but it didn't take long for um, the cabinet ministers to, um, to trust the advice, to accept the advice, and, and that, that allowed me to stay in that job for 10 years and nine months. That's a good period of time. What, what was it at the time, do you think, that made it possible for you to become a woman in that role and for the men around you to adjust to having a woman giving them advice? Because that presumably was quite some, some adjustment they had to make. Um, two things. Firstly is the Prime Minister of the day. He became Prime Minister in 1997, mm -hmm. halfway through the year. Mm -hmm. And then he set about changing the, um, the way the Cabinet operates operated and he wanted a woman, he specifically asked for a woman. Right. He said, I would like to have a different view, a different culture in here. Let's try a woman. So that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing that was in my favor was I was not known at that point. I had just come in, returned to Papua New Guinea in the early 90s. So there was no prejudice in their minds of any of them who the woman was. Right. 
two things that I think were in my favor at that time. The Prime Minister wanting to try out a woman for the job and someone who had some idea of who I was and I was brand new, no one knew me at all. Yes, yes. and with the Prime Minister's support and bringing you in, presumably was he able then to bring the rest of the cabinet along on this journey or did you find that they were not always keen to take advice from a woman? They established a little subcommittee of, of the cabinet, a couple of ministers formed this committee mm. and they had to discuss me, who, I, who on earth I was, because mm. they knew nothing of me. I had grown up outside of Papua New Guinea, so I was not in anybody's experience. Yeah. And I think the Chief Secretary to Government at that point um, did some hard sell. Yeah. And because I was not known, they decided to try me out. Um, and no, it didn't take long, simply because I think they were more curious as to who I was, and because I told myself that my job was to give advice and it has to be the right advice. And it wasn't long before the cabinet ministers realized that they could actually depend on my advice. So in Papua New Guinea, uh, it's known by many people outside who don't know it terribly well, as somewhere where it's quite difficult to be female and do well, where there's high levels of violence, and where one talk, where belonging to a particular clan or tribe or lineage is of real significance and political and other allegiances. Did that play any part in your career as a cabinet secretary? I was looked upon as a, a source for advice in the cabinet room by men. Um, uh, but when I went home to my village, I, I had no voice whatsoever. I couldn't stand up and speak in public even when my family was expected to stand up and speak mm -hmm. in, in public. We had to um, instruct our younger brother, the youngest of us all, to be the mouthpiece of the family. So you speak in an interview I've read that you've given before about um, women having a tendency to be less corrupt in their work and to be more focused than men. At the same time you said that you don't feel you necessarily outperformed your predecessor as cabinet secretary. Um, how do those two sit together for you, that women generally, you, you think, uh, perform to higher standards, yet in your case you're saying you didn't outperform the person who preceded you? Yes. Um, when I say women are more are likely to be less corrupt, um, what I mean is that for us it was work being done in the office and you went home to manage the family at home. For men, that was not necess necessarily the, the, um, the style of, of living. You are likely to have other interests outside of the office and the home. In Papua New Guinea, uh, um, a lot of senior public servants would leave home and go for a drink elsewhere. You know, They would go into the pub or into the nightclubs. When opportunities present themselves for um, corrupt dealings, um, it's easier for men to fall into that than women. I think a woman would be less um, prone to think I in that manner. And is that the case for you? You didn't think in that way? I didn't think in that way. And I did have opportunities to think that sure. way. <laughs> I sure. control information. <laughs> yes, because you were in a very powerful position. Yes. You had access to so, all sorts of private confidential information. I think we were able to resist more of those opportunities being presented to us than the men would. There's uh, one thing I'd like to ask you about. You're on record as saying, I paraphrase only slightly, that the common denominator in women failing to get senior positions in public life is men. Yes. Can you tell me anything more about that statement? Yes, and again, the scene here is Papua New Guinea. It was men making decisions. Yeah. In Parliament, it was men making decisions. We had one woman parliamentarian for almost 20 years. Mm. So you get into a mindset, women get into a mindset that they'll never be good enough because they had been overlooked for so long. Surely they can't make it up there. And I know that my own sister was in such a position. Mm. She rose to be a deputy secretary in the Treasury Department, but that was only because she threatened to leave and they realized they couldn't do without her. So I commission there's three things that you said that I think tie together what the points you've just been making. One is that it's primarily men who make the decisions about women's posts and their positions themselves. So it's quite hard for women to get through that. Secondly, that by constantly being overlooked, women come to understand themselves as not 
competent for the jobs that they are able to do really. And thirdly, that the concept of marriage in Papua New Guinea is very demanding on women and doesn't allow them the space in which to uh, seek senior public life. Is that, is that how you still feel now? Because you were talking about your comments in 2000. Mm -hmm. Here we are nearly 15 years later. Yes. Do you feel that's the mm -hmm. same? I, I feel, um, Dr. Sen, I feel that it's changing now because there's, a, there's another generation now. Um, my daughter's generation, mm. they are of different mindset. This government has also instituted um, free tuition policy. That will bring a lot of change because it now allows girl children to go through the primary school all the way up to secondary school. Mm. So if we have um, mass production of women getting educated and knowing that they have a voice, mm. that is going to change. Mm. At the moment, however, I think we're still battling with it. When you move into the private sector, there's no Papua New Guinean women um, managing any private company or, or at the, up at the management level, right. executive right. level. So here's the thing. Let, let's just focus our last few minutes on your later life, which is as a diplomat. You made a, a, a crossover from uh, national public service to international public service into a field we're looking at quite significantly, where women actually represent their states and their, their countries on the international stage. How did you come to do that? Was it an ambition you always had? Was it an opportunity that just arose? How did you make that transition? I was in private life for two years when I got a telephone call uh, from the head of our foreign affairs department mm -hmm. um, who put the question, who made me the offer if I would like to come to London. But I, it's not a thing that I, I look forward to or I wanted or, or I had ambitions for. Right. Well, there's still um, not very many women diplomats, say, in the community here in London. How, how is it being one of the few women? in that circle? It's a service that is very um, respectful service once you are in. Um, I think all, all parties, men and women, have a voice. Mm. Um, and what we have to remember is that we're speaking for our countries. So no one is intimidated or uh, being a woman I'm not intimidated by my male counterparts simply because my country sent me here thinking that I can represent it mm. um, in the manner in which they expect me to represent it. Thank you very much for your time. You've told us a really interesting story and I wish you very well in keeping Papua New Guinea on the agenda in the diplomatic circles in London. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sen.